Well, I would like to uh, speak, uh, my purpose this morning is to speak on a two-fold subject. Um, the first of these, uh, this subject, first part of it, will be uh, regarding uh, a proper response. Uh, kind of like what Ken was saying there. What is a proper response to this excellent, most excellent sacrifice that's been offered to us? And I'll take it up in a little different way than Ken did. Uh, there's many uh, responses to that, uh, many of them valid, and uh, and uh, so we'll look at one of those or some of those. And uh, I'd also uh, like to speak, secondly, you notice in our letter that we sent out that we talked about the Lord as the fountain of living waters, and we also mentioned the tendency on the part of many, and probably all of us, to carve out for ourselves, to spend energy digging out for ourselves what we know are, the scripture calls cisterns, uh, what kind of cisterns? Broken cisterns that can hold no water. They can't hold any water, but we still spend time digging it. They don't have anything in them that'll, that'll refresh everlastingly. But we spend time and energy digging them out for whatever reason, who knows? Jeremiah 2, the Lord said, My people have committed two evils. Number one, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And then, number two, they've dug out for themselves these cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold any water. So, I'd like you to turn with me uh, to Psalm uh, 103. I want to make some comments before we read part of that. This is a proper response. A man, who's, a man who was after God's own heart wrote this down. It came right out of his heart. Before I read it, I'm going to, I'm probably going to be quoting C.S. Lewis quite a bit. He's one of my favorite authors. And uh, English philosopher, well known to many, died the same day as JFK in 1963. Uh, he went to instant glory. I don't know where JFK went. But uh, spent his life for God. And uh, here's what he said. Human history is a long, terrible story of mankind trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. Think about that. It's the long, terrible story human history is of mankind trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. That's from Mere Christianity published in 1952. He also wrote in the same book, which I highly recommend, by the way, if you haven't read it. I read it over and over. I love it. I give it out so many times. I have to keep ordering it on Amazon again. I thought you ordered that already. It's a good book. He wrote, uh, he wrote this, same book. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Isn't that true? We have desires in us that only the excellency, the excellence of his excellency himself can satisfy. <clears throat> we were created, brethren. For another world, a better world. That's why you're not satisfied when you, you you try this and you try that. And I used to think, oh, if I could just make a hundred grand a year when I started doing that, I go, is that all? Is that it? And then I made two hundred fifty grand a year, and I said, is that it? I, and, and you're never satisfied. You say, is that it? And that's sad if that's what you're after. If you're just after the things of earth, C.S. Lewis also said. If you aim for heaven, you get earth thrown in. If you aim for earth, you don't get either. Amen. It's true. Here's another quote. C.S. Lewis. All these toys, pleasures, treasures, comforts that we have were never intended to possess my heart. 
My true good is in another world, but my only true treasure is in Christ. It's a man who had clear vision. Had his heart right and his head on really, really straight. <clears throat> so let's look at it. The first, uh, the first part here. I just want to quote one more. Have one more quote here. Now think about this. This is what he said. C.S. Lewis again. <clears throat> Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And it's if, if it's true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Now think about that. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. If it's true, it's of infinite importance, Christianity is. If it's false, it's not worth a thing. Which one is it? Well, you know, brethren, we go about living our lives like it was the middle one. Or the last one. Oh, it's just moderately important. You would never say that, would you? You wouldn't have the guts to say it. But that's how we live. We say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's just moderately important. That's that's what it is. You say, what are you talking about, Dave? Are you serious? Well, I'd never say that. Well, your life says it every day, and so does mine. Just think about it. Oh, it's just moderately important. Or I throw everything into it. Everything. Or if it was not worth anything, I, I wouldn't spend any time, wouldn't waste my time. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does that sound like a moderate expression to you? Called out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm glad I'm sitting there and say that. <laughs> Illustration, brother, here we go. His marvelous light. Oh, nothing nothing mundane about that. Nothing lackadaisical about that. Where is my response? Well, let's look at David here. Uh, Psalm 103. A Psalm of David. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. He's overwhelmed right away. Bless the Lord, he tells himself. Oh, my soul. It's like he says, oh, bless the Lord. All that is within me, not 90%, not 60%, not 50%. How much, how, what kind of percent do you, do, you, do you give him? Do you respond? I'm saying that to myself, too. I'm asking me, too. Bless the Lord. God says, this is a man after my own heart. Oh, my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Verse 2, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You notice the order? It's always that, that way in Scripture. It's First it's him, right? And then it's his benefits. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. That's him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Don't forget his benefits. That's the way it's put in Scripture. What, Isaiah chapter 1, right? The ox knows his owner. The ass or the donkey, he, well, he knows his master's crib. He knows, he knows the food trough where that's at. Uh, which one are you? <laughs> which one am I? You know your owner better then you know the benefits. Are, are your your thank your prayer life? Are you thanking him more for the stuff and the good health and the good wealth and all that stuff, all the toys, or is it for himself? Bless the Lord, <coughs> oh my soul. Bless his holy, holy name. It's a man who knew God who said that. I want to ask you if you're here and you're not saved. You might know about God, like we heard last night from Sid. Uh, you might know all about him, even about his resurrect, his death and resurrection. But if all you know is his benefits, man, you are missing out big time. You're missing out. You don't know your maker. 
You don't know the one who created you for his glory. To take you someday off into the never-ending ages of eternity. And show forth daily, well, there's only one day there because there's no night, so let's put it this way. To show forth forever the exceeding riches of his goodness in his kindness toward you. You think about that. A husband who would sit down with his wife in a chair and say, Honey, oh, sweetie pie, as I like to call myself. <clears throat> I want to show you some kindness to, today. And one kindness after another, after another, after another. Does that sound boring to you? No, no, that's not boring. That's awesome. That's love. That's what love is. He's going to bring forth, he's going to set us, those of us who have trusted him as our Savior through his blood and his death, he's going to sit us down at a table someday, and he's going to come forth and serve us. And I'm going to be the first one, probably you're going to be next, will be saying, no, 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 like Peter. No, 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 no. You sit down and we'll serve. Brethren, he's going to serve us. His, his, his servant heart is real. It's real. He's going to come forth and serve us. And we're going to, we're going to marvel. I got leaky tear ducts. Excuse me. We're going to marvel at such a one. Now, I notice, bless the Lord for some reasons here. And I want you to notice... Uh, the who's here. There's five who's. And the reason I want you to notice them is not because we have an owl in the room, but because they're connected the person with the blessing. Who does this? Who does that? Who? It's never the thing is never. Thank you. <laughs> Sweetie pie. <laughs> Ah, and help me for him. Amen. Who forgives all your, verse 3, who forgives all your sins? Well, that's a good place to start. All your iniquities. I see that's the most important transaction. The important thing that I'll ever do for anybody in this world. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? He can do that. Physical diseases, emotional diseases, he can heal them all. He doesn't always choose to do it, it's true, but he can do it. Who redeems your life from destruction? You're a Christian, you want your life to mean something for God? And not just like Paul talked about the Olympic boxing matches, he said, I don't want to be like somebody who just beats the air. The opponent is over there. Man, when I land a blow, I want that dude to feel it. When you go, when you go up against the enemy, you, you, want, you want to miss him? You want to shadow box with Satan? No, no, no. no nothing doing. No, we want our, 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 we want, when you land a punch, make it count through the Spirit of God. Who redeems your life from destruction who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Just think about that. Think about all that you... I, I went around uh, the Thanksgiving time. We, we had a, a family time. We went around the room. I had probably 20 people there. My family, close, close family, and some, some strangers I never met before. And uh, distant relatives. And uh, in fact, one of them the, uh, works here at the seminary. Uh, him and his wife. He's the, he takes in the, uh, the new students and so on. <coughs> Neat guy. And uh, his wife went around the room and we asked, what are you most thankful for, even if it was very painful when it first happened to you? And, you know, we went around and we had six people weeping, telling their 
Oh, just telling their stories about the loving kindness and the tender mercies of God. And some of it started out painful, but they learned that it was, it was good. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And then the last one, verse 5. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, I know there's a good cafeteria over here, and we, and we can apply it that way. I'd rather not, but we'll apply it both ways, right? Natural food and spiritual food. Brethren, if you want your youth renewed like the eagles, you better be eating good stuff. And it's not just going to be, you know, it's not going to be food off the shelf and out of the grocery store. What are you feeding on daily? What am I feeding on? Is it got fins and scales? It's the only thing you were allowed to eat in the Old Testament on fish was fins and scales, right? Had to have both. Had to propel you against the grain, against the flow. And it had to separate you from the evil around you. If what you're feeding on morally, the videos you watch, the music you listen to, if it's not separating you from your culture, this wicked culture, guess what? You're going with the flow. I had to get rid of a whole series of DVDs in my, my house this year. I judged myself. If we judge ourselves, we would not be judged of the Lord. And I said, you know, what is that? I haven't watched that thing in years. And I go, what is that doing in my house? Somebody walks in here and goes, what? Dave's Rickers got the James Bond series, every movie that was ever put out uh, since 1963. What is that doing in there? I paid 110 bucks for it. I, I got to throw that away. Oh, yes, I did. I said that. The Bourne, I, the Bourne uh, trilogy, Jason Bourne. I have a guy named Bourne on my block now. Same spelling. Look at James Bourne moved right down the street. I don't need the movie. And uh, my, my goodness, you listen to those darn things? Darn things, there's a minced oath. Listen to those things, and guess what? They blaspheme God more every, as the series goes on, the blasphemy gets worse. And I go, what, am, why am I listening to this garbage? It's out of here. Clean house. Away with it. Who needs it? May the Lord help us in these things. To have good things to feed on. Whose youth is renewed like the eagles. I don't care what age you are. You can have your youth renewed like the eagles, lifted up on wings. I just wanted you to notice that, how careful the Spirit of God was to, again, to connect the blessing, or excuse me, the blesser with the blessing. And you know, everything in our culture, then we got three enemies, right? The world. The system that Satan has set up, the flesh, that's the inward enemy, and the devil are going to do everything in their power. They've been set up specifically to try to get you separated, to separate out in your mind and conscience the blesser from the blessing so that you get occupied with the thing instead of him. Don't let it happen. We're not ignorant of his devices. Sid spoke last night. He spoke of the Lord Jesus as the creator of all things. And he also spoke of him as the redeemer, the one who died for us. And then he said something very striking. He said, those two are striking too, but he, but he said, he's the sustainer of everything. He sustains everything. Or what you say, Sid? He, uh, by, th by him, all things consist. Held together. Pardon? Held together. Yeah, they're held together by him. Held together. Now think about this. The man who died on Calvary in those three hours of darkness, was he holding it all together then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. While I saw, here's a quote from the Psalms. While I suffer your terrors, I am distracted. Is it possible for God to be distracted? Oh, yeah. You know, the Son of God, just once, just once in his history, was distracted. And it was because he was burying my sins in his own body on that tree. But while he did it, 
He held everything together. He sustained life. There's a verse in Job, uh, the two verses, Job 34, 15 and 16, says this. JMD translation, Job is Nelson Darby. Listen to this. If he, God, only thought of himself and got, gathered together his spirit and his breath, all flesh would expire together. Think about that. If God just stopped thinking about everybody else like we do and thought only about himself for one day or just a minute, all flesh would immediately expire. That's how held you are. That's how sustained I am before God. Uh, it, it's marvelous. It's marvelous. And to think about this high and lofty one who would condescend to dwell in human flesh, number one, and then go further and condescend to dwell in me and in you, it's marvelous. We ought, we ought to be focused on it. That same uh, writer, Darby, he says this. He, he was in England at the time, born in Ireland, but he, he was in England. He said, if the queen came to visit me for the day, I couldn't think of anything else. But I go half the day without thinking about him. Just think about it. Isn't it true? <clears throat> if the queen came, oh my goodness, we, we wouldn't talk about anything else. We'd tell everybody, the queen's coming. Come on over. Get a look over the back fence, you know, whatever. And yet, we forget him. Jeremiah 2, again. Same place where he says, two evils forsaken me. He says this, can a maid or a virgin forget her ornaments? The maids in Israel, they wore ornaments to show they were virgin. Can a bride forget her garment? Can a bride on her wedding day forget her wedding dress? Could she do that? Well, she didn't think of anything else hardly, except the, the, the bridegroom once in a while. <laughs> Once in a while. I, I love seeing those pictures of the mother of the bride. They're, they're precious. <clears throat> Could she do that? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. You think, you think about it. it. It's amazing how fickle we are. C.S. Lewis, again, he said, When Christ died, he died for you. Individually, just as much as if you had been the only person in the world. That's from mere Christianity as well. It's often quoted. He also said this. God has infinite attention to spare for each one of us. You are as much alone with him when you want to be as if you were the only being he had ever created. You believe that? The God, the living God, when you go, why else would he tell you, when you pray, I'll tell you what, go into your closet and shut your door so that your father, which sees in secret, can himself reward you openly. He, he says it twice there. I quoted it wrong. Sees in secret. He sees in secret. This is the God we have, brethren. He does. He sees in secret. He rewards openly. We had this uh, dilemma with the uh, conference. We needed a $3 million rider. Was it $3 million, you said, for the, for the assurance? And it just wasn't happening for a month or so, whatever. So I, I said to Sid on our Tuesday morning prayer meeting, we've been praying for two or three months for you and for this conference. And I said, well, let's ask him to do it today. And Sid almost fell out of his chair. <laughs> I'll speak for him. <laughs> What? Is he nuts? <laughs> so we did. I, I said, Lord, why don't you just do it today so we can go ahead with this conference? This is like less than a week ago, brethren. <clears throat> well, guess what? Four o'clock, I get a text from Sid. You know what it said. We got the rider. <laughs> so praise God. He's that good all the time. I want you to turn to Psalm 96 also. If you would, Psalm 96. And uh, just a few verses there. I think it was written by the same man. 
uh, verses 7 and through 9. It says, Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering to come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, verse 10, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. So on. Give unto the Lord the glory, verse 8, do his name. What is a proper response? That's it. Give unto the Lord the glory that's due unto his name. I'm going to leave it for your heart and mine. To decide what what is that what's it look like well we we got some of it here bring an offering and come into his courts are you a regular participant in blessing the Lord in a company of Christians I recommend it when you come bring an offering we, we're not coming there to get entertained we didn't come to, to get the blessing we come on Lord's Day morning as we break the bread and pass the cup to give an offering. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto him and bless his name. May the Lord help us with that. I'd also uh, like to turn to part two of my talk now. The second part where I, we, we talked about the, the Lord is the fountain of living waters. And... Uh, these broken cisterns that we carve out and our tendency to do it. I'd like to talk about it in, as lay out, lay out briefly the, the, the sin that's involved in both of those things, but then talk about the remedy. What do we do about it? You know, if, that, if, we're, if we've forsaken the Lord in our souls in some measure, even as believers, if we've walked away from him and gotten thrilled with something better, quote unquote, better, something more attractive that takes up our time and our energy, some video game or some other nonsense, Wh whatever it is that just you just can't get away from it, it's addictive. There's a, there's a path in Scripture that helps. There's some steps that you can take to get delivered. And I've taken those steps personally uh, within the last eight months. And so I want to recommend them to you. And it's helped a lot. Um, C.S. Lewis, talking about Jesus as the fountain. He's the fountainhead. Here's what C.S. Lewis said. Once in our world, in a stable, excuse me, once in our world, a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. You think about it. Once in our world's history, a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. Turn with me just to uh, two verses. Uh, Isaiah 66, verse 1 and 2. Well, he's not living in a stable right now. He's in heaven. But he, but he does condescend to live in his people. But just listen to this. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where's the house that you'll build me? Says that to Israel. Where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. He now remember, he said, where am I going to rest? Where am I going to live? On this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Uh, brethren, that's where the living God lives today. In people who are poor and of a contrite spirit, humble, and tremble at his word. That's where the, the Quaker take their, their claim from that verse, that, that quake at his word, tremble at his word. I trust we do tremble 
at his word, just to tremble for joy. Not, not, I mean, it's awesome fear, you know, that when God speaks, that it's like thunder, watch out. But it's, there's quaking for joy, too. There is. <clears throat> and so, uh, this fountain that we're speaking of, real briefly, you know, there's a water tower over Santa Ana off the five freeway. I, it's probably about 80 feet tall. I'm just guessing from a distance, maybe 120 feet tall. And if, if your house is above the 120 feet, how much water pressure you got? Oh, that'd be zero, right? Because why? I was a plumber for 30 years. That's easy, right? So, uh, yeah, well, because it only rises this high as its source. You can't go any higher. Where did our fountain come from? Where does the blessing of Christians come from? Oh, from heaven itself, from the heart of God. Right down into your heart, and then if you receive it, it flows out like river, rivers of living water everywhere. And it also has the capacity to go right back up to God. We love because he first loved us. That's, that's the pattern. And we even love him. It goes right back to God because the source is that high. We love him. It's an infinite cycle because he first loved us. That's the way it's supposed to work. And uh, sometimes we get clogged pipes. It doesn't work so good. But I want you to turn to Hebrews 12, and we're going to look at this. Uh, there's two things that I, I want to point out as that I identified in my life that were slowing me down spiritually. <coughs> I just want to point them out briefly, and then we'll talk about the remedy for these two things. Hebrews, uh, what did I say, 12? Uh, 1 through 4. Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, that's the first thing, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, that is the second thing, and run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, there's the fountainhead, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's far enough, those two verses. Well, there's two things that can slow down a believer in response to his God. Every weight, let's lay it aside, he says. It's not sinful. It's just that if you're going to go run like Tim Wright spoke in the Sunday school recently in Planet Park, and he brought some ankle weights, some heavy, no, he brought some uh, construction boots. And he goes, now, would you put these things on to run a 50-yard dash or a 100-yard dash? And the kids are all going, what are you, nuts? You know? uh, here we go. What are we, nuts? We do it, don't we? We put weights on ourselves. We encumber our lives with all kinds of stuff. And then we expect to run. We expect, oh yeah, I'm ready, Lord. Bring it on. Oh yeah, it, it's not a sprint. I know. It's a it's a long distance race. But I used to be a long distance runner. We used to wear the thinnest shoes that you could imagine. And even our spikes were calculated to be thin so that just the length that we needed in order to get around that track and not, and not slow us down. And silky uh, jockey shorts, whatever they were, and, and vest silk silks. Get rid of the weight if you're going to run. That's what you want to do. And the sin that so easily besets us. Just think about that. It's easy. It comes on us easy. Why is that? Because our, we have that fallen nature in us that is just so attracted to any nonsense that comes along any distraction, and we're living in a day of distraction like the world has never seen a day like this for distraction. Many running to and fro, knowledge increased, devices increasing. Do we really need them all? You need four or five. What, what did Willis do? A little content? You got five of them? If you got five of them, let's sell four on eBay and have one or, or keep two, whatever. But my goodness, that's, that's pushing it. 
in my opinion. If we want to be helped in these things, uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five recommendations briefly. Number one, if you want to get rid of some of these weights, like I have, you want to be in complete earnestness about your commitment to being a daily disciple of God. You want to be dead serious with God. You want to stop playing around, stop being half and half. Jesus said, unless a man forsakes everything he has, he cannot be my follower. Do you think he was kidding? Oh, it was an exaggeration or a typo? I, I don't think so. No, he doesn't talk that way. Unless a man forsakes everything he has. Does that mean you have to give it all up? No, of course not. It means you have to let go of it in your heart and give it to him and let him direct it. You got assets? Great. Let him direct them. He's the director. He's the Lord. That's what lordship is all about. C.S. Lewis said this. Listen to this. The terrible or terrifying thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. And I trust him if I turn everything over to him if I surrender to that guy pardon that to that guy excuse me Lord if I surrender to that man everything all of my precautions we were so careful to just make sure we did it all right so we get the best blessing you, the best choice in your life for a, a bride or a job or whatever if I turn all that over to him C.S. Lewis says that's the most difficult thing in the world, almost impossible, unless you know him, unless you really know him. And you say, oh, he's that good. I can trust him with this. Of course I can. Of course you can. Of course I can. He created me for his glory. He knows what's best. One more C.S. Lewis quote here. Nothing... <coughs> that you have not given away will ever be truly yours. That's mere Christianity also. It's a good book. Nothing that you <coughs> have not given away to God will ever be truly yours. Jesus said as much the same thing, right? He that keepeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life shall keep it unto life eternal. Psalm 19, I'm not going to turn to it for time's sake. David says, who can understand his errors? He says to God, cleanse me from hidden faults. Cleanse me, that's Psalm 19, verses 12 to 14. Cleanse me from hidden faults. They're, they're secret from me. I don't see them. They're blind spots. I'm writing a book right now on blind spots. That believers have. Not that unbelievers have. I'll get to that. Put it on the New York Times bestseller list, whatever. Just to get it out there. But if the Lord wills. But I'm writing this for believers. I think we have a we have a big need. I have a big need. Blind spots. Brethren, if I have blind spots, I need you to help me see them. I don't I don't see them because they're blind. That's the worst thing about blind spots, is that they're blind. The worst kind of blindness is here's the worst kind. Not knowing that you're blind. That's the worst kind of blindness. The Pharisees had it. John chapter 9 at the end. Keep back also your servant from presumptuous sins. And don't let him have dominion over him. So he's got both. He's got the weights and he's got the sins, both. Psalm 139, same thing. Search me, O God, and know me. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. You know, if you pray that prayer, I'll tell you what three things are going to happen. If you mean business with God, number one, God is going to answer that prayer for sure. He'll show you. And he's gentle. He starts gentle. If you don't listen, he'll get a little more loud. The second thing is that you're going to get very uncomfortable for a time. Say, I don't like being uncomfortable. 
Well, then you don't like growing. Because it, you have to be just uncomfortable sometimes to grow. Oftentimes. And the third thing is it's going to work out for your eternal blessing. Is it worth it? I reckon that the, 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 the troubles of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed to us. Just think about it. An eternal weight of glory, the scripture talks about. The sufferings of this little while are not worthy to be compared with an eternal weight of glory. <clears throat> Number three, be dead honest with God and others that seek to help you. When he, when he shows it to you, be very honest with God about the conclusions that you reach. If you need to take action, take it. Don't don't pussyfoot around. Don't say, well, yeah, that, that 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 makes sense, Lord. Maybe someday. No, no, no. Deal with it now. Do it now. When when the Lord convicted me about my videos, I was in I was sitting and breaking a bread, I think, when he did it. And I went home and probably twenty minutes after we were home, I was in the trash. It's good to do that. Fourth one, stop making excuses for yourself. Now, there's personal excuses. You can make them to yourself. It, it, you justify it to yourself. you got all kinds of reasons why, yeah, but, well, that, that's going to stop you. That's going to hinder you. You can make arguments to others and try to justify yourself as to why you should keep this in your life. What does Scripture say about that? It says, if I justify myself, my own mouth condemns me. My own mouth is condemning me while I'm trying to justify my why I need to keep this sin or this weight in my life. And the third thing is you can just simply compare yourself to other people and say, well, I'm not as bad as he is. So when he gets rid of his, I'll get rid of mine. Oh, that, that makes real good sense, doesn't it? No, it doesn't make any sense at all, does it? No. Comparing yourselves among yourselves, you're not wise. The last one is to be open to daily checkups from God. This isn't a one-time thing. Daily checkups from God. Ask the Lord continually. You know, Elihu said to Job, Elihu, speaking about the Spirit of God, he says, you know, it's appropriate, Job, to, be, to say unto God this, that which I don't see, you teach me. And if I've sinned, I won't do it anymore. I'll stop. That's an appropriate thing to say to God. Check out. <coughs> so, brethren, may the Lord help us to uh, respond appropriately to him. I don't know how it's gonna what's gonna look like in your life or in my, my in mine as the Lord leads, but may we have the courage to draw near to the fountain of living waters. He can satisfy your deepest desires because he created them. Don't don't be fooled. He's got it handled. You can roll it over to him. You can trust him with the college, with the boyfriend, with the with the marriage. You can trust him with all of that because he, he's way ahead of you. When he puts forth his own sheep, he goes in front of them. John 10, verse 4. You can trust him. Let's pray. Blessed God, our Father, we give thanks for the Lord Jesus, our Savior. And we thank you, Lord, that you're patient with us, uh, taking us daily, step by step, moment by moment. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the singing. How it thrills our souls to look up to you, to, to just be uh, able to express to you what you mean to us. In some little measure to give unto you the glory that's due unto your name. And we know we're feeble, but you appreciate it. We know that from scripture. And we appreciate that you appreciate it. And we just give you thanks. We Help us lead us, Lord. Help us to lay aside these weights, to identify them be honest with you and others. Help us to invite others to help us with our blind spots and to not justify ourselves. 
Help us to glorify you. We give thanks in your precious name. Amen.